This movie gets four and a half bananas out of five, according to the No More Stinky Monkeys website. Clint Eastwood, at the age of 78 and a half, has directed the most thoroughly entertaining movie of his life and done the best acting of his long and rewarding career. Gran Torino is that good. Commercials don't lie. Not about him being tough, and they don't lie about him brandishing a gun. But that's just 20 minutes of the movie. The rest of the time, Clint is swearing and throwing around racial epithets with comic delight. He's a very tired, very cranky old Ford Motor Works retiree who happens to be a big time bigot living in a rundown Detroit residential community. He's surrounded by Asians, many of whom seem to be Mongs, spelled H M O N G. Mong is not a country, but a select group of Asians who come from places like Laos, Vietnam, and China. The Hmong people fought on the side of the Americans during the Vietnam War. And when the Americans left, the Hmong had to escape from being hunted down by the Viet Cong. When they got to America, the Lutherans helped them set up housing in the terrible winter country of Michigan. These neighbors are just reminders to Eastwood's Walt Kowalski of the people he had to kill in the Korean War. Walt was given a medal of bravery for his actions, but he carries with him some haunting guilt for the things he did that it turns out he was not ordered to do. The opening scene shows Walt at his loving wife's funeral and his disgust at what passes for his family. Two overweight sons who don't seem to like him, and grandchildren will make a mockery of their grandmother's mass. One granddaughter wears its shirt exposing her belly and does text messaging throughout the ceremony. This seemed over the top to me, but maybe in some families that could happen. I hope not. Later she asks if she could have Walt's prize, 1972, Ford Gran Torino when he dies. Could average kids be that heartless? I mean, the parents don't seem to think this behavior is all that horrible or even unusual. Anyway, the Mong family that lives next door are named the Lores and cause Walt most of his indigestion. But when he stops a local gang from attacking the family, he becomes a neighborhood hero. This is the kind of attention this loner does not want. Then you add in a 27-year-old do-gooder priest who is intent on watching out for Walt because he made a solemn promise to Walt's dead wife that he would, and you can see that Kowalski cannot get any peace. But like Archie Bunker, all that racist facade masks a good heart, and a man so lost inside himself he needs strangers to help him come out. Once he is invited to the Lord's home for a party, he slowly becomes a part of their lives. The teenage daughter, played by Ani Ahar, takes a special interest in him and patiently explains her family's culture. One funny scene has Walt sitting at the kitchen table with a bunch of older Hmong women happily shoveling food on his plate. Apparently, Walt is not too racist around the ladies and he certainly enjoys Hmong cooking. But his relationship with the teenage son of the family, Tao, which both makes up and gives the movie its heart. Tao, played by B. Vang, at first seems slow, but he's only quiet and shy without a male influence is stuck doing what they consider female chores like dishes and gardening. After 50 years of building Fords, Walt is disgusted by his own sons working for foreign car companies, so he has an innate need to show this boy how to be a man. The script was written by a first-timer named Nick Schenk, and while it has some clunky moments, it usually hits its target with great aim. Some of the racist dialogue rings true, and sometimes it seems forced and hollow. But when Clint is mingling with the Hmong people, and he calls them names, you laugh at the sheer nerve of him. Trying to get Tao to man up and ask a beautiful young girl for a date, Walt calls the girl Yum Yum, and the three boys who are after her, Ding Dong, Click Clack, and Charlie Chan. Clint was always a huge movie star, but his acting was always admittedly kind of stiff, at least until he made Unforgiven in 1992. And since then, has improved with every movie. I thought he was great in The Line of Fire, but here he blows the doors off that performance. I don't care about Oscars, but it would be a nice star in his tree if he finished up his acting career with one for this role. Kind of like when John Wayne won for True Grit. Two side notes. While talking to a friend at work today, Big Tom, we discussed how in the late 70s and early 80s, the two biggest movie stars in the world were Clinton and Burt Reynolds. Some loved one, some loved the other. Some, like me, thought they were both great. But Big Tom said that in high school back then, he told his friends, You wait and see. Twenty years from now, Clint will still be big and Bert will fall by the wayside. Boy, was he ever right. And the biggest reason this happened is that Clint stayed true to himself. He got old gracefully and didn't bother with plastic surgery. And Bert, well, you know what Bert looks like. Finally, the barber. 
Clint directs this movie with such ease the two hours fly by. And despite the terrible way the neighborhood lives, he lives in has fallen apart, there are still traces of the one he used to live in. His barber represents that forgotten past, and is played by John Carroll Lynch. Lynch played Francis McDormand's husband in Fargo, the one who tried to get a stamp made from his painting. He's a good character actor, but there is a link that exists between him and Clint that people may not have realized. Lynch played Arthur Lee Allen in Zodiac, the man they finally arrested as the Zodiac Killer, and Clint played the detective who goes after the Zodiac Killer in the first Dirty Harry movie, but in that film they call him the Scorpio Killer. So, do you feel lucky, punk? From the Frederick.